Welcome to Real Talk and ELT, a podcast that talks about the reality of teaching English. All right, let's get going, because otherwise we'll get very distracted. <laughs> we can just sit here and chat for hours. Uh, all right. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Real Talk and ELT. I'm here with Rob Howard. Welcome, sir. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you for being here today. Oh, oh no, it's the other way around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me introduce you, sir, because we're going to get into a controversial topic, and I'm going to try to keep up with you by playing devil's advocates. I don't know if I'm not, uh, I might not be able to, but uh, so Rob Howard is the owner of Online Language Center and Business Language Training Institute and founder of EFL Talks. EFL Talks is a, is a what? It's basically a collection done by 400 different EFL talkers and um, English teachers. Nice. We have over 600 10 minute videos on anything you need to know about teaching, all available free anytime for you to watch. So, to help teachers everywhere around the world. Amazing resource. Okay. He is also EFLtalks.com. EFLtalks.com. We'll put it into the show notes so people can click on it. And just um, he's a teacher, writer, and frequent worldwide speaker and trainer in business English, teacher development and entrepreneurship, teaching online, and using technology and images. I did go to see the you did something for EduFest. I had to run out, but um, very interesting and bringing some reality to some of the mentoring that we see online. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the idea. Uh -huh. um, he is an IATEFL Poland Vice President, Joint Coordinator for the uh, IATEFL BSIG, Gallery Teaches Masterclass Presenter, ITDI, TOEFL Course Trainer, Member of the C Group, Online Event Coordinator for the Visual Arts Circle, as well as Co-Founder of the Independent Authors and Publishers. You are living in Poland, sir. You never sleep. You just nap. I believe it. <laughs> Correct. It's like it's cat naps in between your projects. Actually, I sleep during my classes. I find it refreshing. Uh, utterly. <laughs> I just... <laughs> okay. Ask my students. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh, not a great business model, Rob. <laughs> it works for me. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So the We're going to have fun today, Kelly. All right? Whether you want to or not. <laughs> Fair. I'm, I'm game. Uh, okay. So I did want to bring you on one because obviously uh, you've got a lot of experience and you hold a slightly controversial, we'll say, opinion that business can, business English cannot be taught to lower levels. Is that a, an accurate statement of your opinion? Cannot is a very strong word. Mm. I would prefer to say probably should not how's that better that's fine we're gonna get very concise today so, <laughs> so i feel like we should start with defining business english because we say business english as if everybody really understands that term or what we're referring to so how would you because i'm going to try and play devil's advocate here how would you define business english then well, basically what you're asking me to do is answer what is the question of life? Yes. You know, yes. here. Um, business English, as I know Evan's been here, and I use Evan's thing, um, Evan Friendos, it's an umbrella term, and it just encompasses so much. Um, we could do probably three hours on what business English is. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be better to say what business English isn't, but I won't do that. Um, if you want. No, no. I'm on the podcast. It, I do whatever I want. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Always go to the top. Um, <laughs> you know, business English, really, it it's anything that's used in the workplace for communication, whether it be presentations, negotiations, correspondence, um, having to do reports. So it's anybody who's working in the career and they need to be able to communicate. And it's basically specialized communication okay. that's used within, you know, the workplace. And um, 
I know a lot of people are making business English bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're teaching skills now, and people are teaching leadership and this thing and that thing. Yes, it's kind of encompassed in business English because it's originally business English teachers that are doing it. The main thing is no matter what it is you're teaching or working with, that you're working on perfecting communication in the English language for the job. How's that? Well, it's good. I, I appreciate that definition. And I, it's, yeah, it's hard to nail it down because, well, and I think one of the misconceptions of teachers that are entering into the business English field, we'll say, that don't really have a lot of experience in business. I think one, they're at a slight disadvantage because they don't know what ha what actually happens. So they tend to go towards the terminology. More than slight. <laughs> and, and, and right. And so then they tend to go towards terminology and, and functional exponents. And while all those things are great, really, we're trying to facilitate communication here. And so sometimes that doesn't really encompass what it means. So then, exactly. okay, so we can, we can agree on your definition. Mm -hmm. So why do you think it should not be taught to lower levels? Well, it depends again, what you're considering business English to be. For example, you're talking with somebody who's at an A1 or an A2 level. Mm -hmm. Can they do anything that they're supposed to do in their job that they could do in their first language? No. Maybe business English at that point is a taxi driver, is a waiter, is somebody delivering your pizza. Now, remember, we have to look at what the capabilities of an A1, an A2, and even a B1 are. For instance, um, if you look at the CEFR, a B1 student here, I'll give you some things. I did this just for you today. I appreciate um, it. <laughs> a B1 student may have difficulty understanding technical texts. Okay. So um participating in complex discussions difficult advanced grammar b1 doesn't have it they don't even have full use of conditionals yet for instance a b1 hasn't done the third conditional okay. cannot talk about hypotheticals and what is business 90 percent talk about hypotheticals so how is an A1, an A2, or a B1 supposed to get by in business at that level? Well, let, so, me, give, let me give you a counter argument, okay? Because sure. yeah. I agree with that point. Here's my And I'm going to agree with you, okay. probably. <laughs> Great. Okay, so here's my counter argument to that. What if their job function doesn't require them to do read technical texts or, or be in complex negotiations what if their job simply is for example um a receptionist or or at a, a international hotel where they're greeting and it's very transactional and it they're just they need to get information wouldn't that it, wouldn't they be able to perform that type of function at an a let's say an a2 or maybe b1 level well, Kelly, if you're an A1 or an A2 receptionist, and I say to you, well, if I were to leave a message, do you think somebody will get back to me later on today? Are you going to understand what I just said? No, because you don't have that level of English. So this is why I say, what is their level? Okay, a taxi driver. Mm -hmm. A receptionist would probably be fine. But I'm just saying, in a professional business, is that good enough for me? It's not. Well, and yeah, no, if I, I'm I get that. Lawyer, uh. I I don't want that. 
I understand what you're saying, but I also I also think that there's a lot of different functions and there's a lot of different stages within a business. So we we can't only look at C-suite levels and and you know the the people who are going out and interacting on complex levels. I think that there's a lot of people who function within businesses that maybe can get I'm going to, I'm going to put this very, oh, I'm going to hedge a lot today. They can get by with an A2 level because they still are functioning within the business environment and they're still be, they're able to do some tasks that now it might not be all tasks, but it's still something. So shouldn't we consider them business English learners? Because. No, no because no, okay, what, what have you taught them? You've taught them general English. Remember, A1, A2, B1, the tasks that they are able to handle mm. are day-to-day -day personal tasks. Talking about meeting somebody, maybe checking in at a hotel, maybe ordering something at a restaurant. That's not business English. That's general English. So okay. the things that you're using and teaching in general English at A1, A2, B1, that's great. Now, I'm not saying don't teach it, but I'm saying there's a great caveat here because, number one, if I'm hiring a business person to do a job in Brazil, mm. they're fluent in Portuguese, I hope. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> they're fluent, fluent in their job. They know how to do their job. Mm -hmm. So I'm not teaching them how to do their job. I'm teaching them how to communicate their job at the level they already can in English. And in order to get to that professional level, if I'm talking a professional, I'm not talking the receptionist now, I'm going up to executive level, they need to have at least minimum B2 preferably C1, C2 level, to be able to communicate and work at the same level that they can in L1. So this I is where I make the distinction. And I know, you know, you're going to ask me later about course books, and I may as well bring it up now. Um, I know I am there's- I going to ask you about course books. So then why do we sell course books at the A2 level? Um, you said the key word. You want to repeat that? Sell. So sell exactly <laughs> and i need to be careful because a lot of my friends write these books um <clears throat> interesting question ask how many of the textbook writers out there who teach actually use their own books because you know what most of them don't because they know it is not practical but there's a market out there for a1 books in fact if you notice I don't know for a fact, but I'll say from what I see out there on the market, there's more books at A1, A2, B1, B2 than there are at C1, C2. I can't find good advanced books. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, that's them. been my experience as well. Yeah. So it's the market because business English now, as you see, is a huge market. Remember, I was in Brazil up to seven years ago, and I started the BSIG there, and everybody was like, oh, business English. No, 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 we don't need that. That's stupid. That's too hard. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants to teach business English because that's what's making money. It's the same with the books. And again, okay, but then where yes you should start somewhere but don't call it business english when it's a1 it's not it's communication professional maybe okay so then because i think that we are aligned with okay somewhat aligned with this i'm trying to play devil's advocate without my own thing it's escaping too much but then so the the books would they i mean they do serve a purpose for pre-service workers kids in university who have no job experience they don't really understand what's going on would you consider a pre-service business english course business English. 
I guess I, I can't say business English, like a pre-service course using a course book. Would you consider that business English or no? I would much rather um, call it, it more like life skills, life skills. How about life skills? Okay. And start there and rename it life skills. If, if I don't know if you saw it, um, we tried to do the impossible. We did um, a collaboration between the IATFL Young Learners and Teen SIG and the BSIG just about a month or so I ago. I saw that. I wasn't able to watch, but yes, I saw it. Mm -hmm. But everybody said it was impossible. Young Learners and Business English, and the whole idea was we should be teaching these life skills with the A1, A2, B1 books in high school. We should be starting there. Okay. And that's a good level for those books. But to walk in to in company with an executive and hand him an A1 book, you know, it doesn't have what he needs for his job. It's not even close. And he's not going to get there until he reaches a B2 level. So that's the question. Are you a business English teacher working in a company or are you an English teacher working at a business? And that's a big distinction. And so then can we know, define what a business English teacher actually is and what that encompasses? No, it's ah. an umbrella that encompasses everything. Well, there's well, no right, well, there's no right answer. Well, maybe and like I'm not skills. even gonna try. Well, maybe the <laughs> skills that people <laughs> maybe the skills that people use because there is a misconception that you can just pick up a book and head in, regardless of the level, even if you're kind of new or you're more experienced. Sure. Everybody can. Pick up a book and and just you're a business English teacher. Is that how it is? Right. Well, that's the common misconception. And I remember years back when the first market leader book came out and I was teaching for a course in Rio. And, um, you know, I taught all the in-company classes for Petrobras and law firms and everything around. And when they came up with too many classes that I couldn't handle them all, they started getting good experienced teachers. And they said, okay, here, now you go in and teach. Here's market leader. And every single one of them came up to me and said, Rob, I don't understand half of this book. Because, yes, they're brilliant teachers. they brilliant level of English, not, that, not the problem. But they didn't understand any business concept at all. So the book was worthless for them to work with because the students actually understood more than the teacher did. And that's embarrassing. So it, they understood more, is, not the linguistic stuff, but the content. Not the linguistic, the yeah. concept of business. Mm -hmm. But if, if you don't have an idea of, um, I don't know if you cook, Kelly, but if you don't know how to cook. I mean, and, a fellow Bostonian, you know that I can cook. <laughs> but let's say you can't boil water like one of my ex-wives. <laughs> uh, you know, you don't put her in charge of a five-star restaurant. Right. You know, and this is the problem that unfortunately many people have jumped on the business English bandwagon to make money and they don't understand. They're great teachers, don't get me wrong. It's not about them not being qualified as a teacher, but they're saying they're a business English teacher. They should be saying, I'm an English teacher for business people. There's a distinction. Can you kind of hash that distinction out? Can you kind of? You're helping him with English, but you're not aware of what the business person needs to communicate. You're going to have to figure it out the hard way and you're going to have to learn. And I think this is where you said before a slight advantage. I think people that have a business background have a great advantage over teachers that don't. Quite frankly, teachers are great teachers and know nothing about business. We've seen this with all the entrepreneurship stuff coming out. They don't understand how to run business. And nothing wrong with that. A business person usually doesn't know how to be a good teacher. So, you know, converse. Um, the thing is that, you know, you can't just step in and say, I'm a business English teacher. You need to get some training. You need to understand business. 
you need to understand a lot more, <laughs> excuse me, than just, you know, the verb to be and how to work a conditional. Right. Yeah, I I know. I I I'm having a hard time being the devil's advocate to that, and just wanting to say my opinions on all of this. But I agree with you. I think that there's there there has to be a certain level of understanding of what's happening in the business environment. If you have experience in that, it gives you a huge advantage because you know how the meetings, for example, when say. Well, I get very concerned when people say, well, I have a workshop on how, how to deal with meetings in English. <laughs> do, do you have anxiety when you see those? Because I do. I say, well, what kind of meetings? What's the hierarchical structure within the meetings? What are you guys talking about? Is it negotiation? Are you trying to settle some terms? What, what, what exactly are you doing in those meetings? And then they look at you and they go, huh? Uh, exactly. Yeah. And so then I'm like, well, you can't just say that that every yeah. single meeting is done. Are we talking about a stand up meeting for for, you know, IT? Do they use agile principle? What are the frameworks that are used? And they're like, what, I, I, what are they standing up? <laughs> yeah, so these are the types yeah. of things that, you know, we can't overgeneralize. There are some universe maybe some universal principles that we could put into place but even myself i get surprised every day i had a, a student recently that that went on a, an interview met mm -hmm. with a lot of hostility because the um the interview the person who was doing the interview was was kind of cornered into a hiring process that he had no participation in and it was based on de and i which is fine but the company was implementing this DEI program and they said, well, what do you need? And he said, I need a person for this position. And they said, okay. And then they, it was not, it was a technical position for a, a tax accountant. They put it as a tax manager. They, mm -hmm. he didn't have any hand in writing the, the job description. Then mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was a mess. Um, they only hired, they only interviewed female candidates because they needed to fill a quota. And so uh -huh. when my poor student walked into the scenario, the the manager was like, I don't even, uh, I, he, was, he was just frustrated. He wasn't frustrated at her, but he took it out on her. And uh -huh. he, he made the job seem very undesirable. Uh -huh. And so thank God I was able to, before not, I had no, you know, preconceived notion, oh, that this might happen, but she's, she's good and she's a good enough English student that she was able to navigate a very uncomfortable situation like well I, I think that there might have been a misunderstanding etc cetera, etc cetera. but she was almost not attacked but you know it was a tense situation mm -hmm. me preparing her for what your, what are your strengths what are your weaknesses didn't help at all in that scenario because that's not what they talked about well that's it it's in this is one of the things about business English is you know, business English is like life. It just happens. And sometimes the best plan is no plan at all because, you know, business English, like business, is not predictable. Life is predictable. A course book follows predictions and follows linearly. Life and business aren't like that, though. Right. And, you know, people say to me all the time, well, you know, I don't have to be... I'm a good teacher. I don't have to understand business to do it. But let me ask this as, as a Brazilian, you know, would you hire a, a football coach who never played football or doesn't understand the game? Nope. No. No. Uh, would you hire a flight instructor that's never flown? No. 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 Um, God, no. That would be such a huge safety risk. <laughs> you know, would you, would you want to? your doctor trained by a person who only studied first aid, you know, they know CPR and how to put a splint on, but they don't know medicine. No. So you're looking at qualifications and that's just like, sorry, I won't pick on Brazil. Yes, I will, but not just Brazil. But I mean, what about all those students out there that need C1, C2, but yet their teachers are only B1, B2, you know, do you, do you, get an unqualified teacher at a lower level than you to teach you advanced English. Yeah. No. 
So this is the thing. You have to have something. And I'm not saying that there's a perfect, you have to do this to do it. Because we're all individuals. I know some great teachers who, you know, didn't get the certification, didn't get qualified, um, aren't business background, but they concentrate on different things. They concentrate on the, just the communication part of it, the writing part of it. And that's needed. Mm -hmm. So not everybody has to be the perfect business background. You know, I worked in this and everything else, but most of them do have to. <laughs> well, what about people who have, okay. So teachers that I, again, I agree with you, but teachers that have been working for a while and they say, you know, I need to kind of change pace or I'm starting to get interested in business or maybe the school that they're working for says, you know, we're starting to see this. Would anybody be willing to take these classes? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more than just kind of keeping up with the news, right? It's not just going onto oh, yeah. websites and saying, oh, this is happening in the world. No. I, I recommend for that teacher, even before they decide to make the move, go to Coursera, go to Udemy, go to a night school, take a free course in basic business. Mm. Just get an idea. Now, I'm not saying you have to be an expert. Um, you know, I, I used to teach oil and gas. What did I know about oil and gas? I used oil in my cooking and, you know, I used gas to cook with. Um, that was it. And, you know, then I started working with lawyers. What did I know about um, Brazilian law? Actually, now, after all these years and working with so many, I learned from my students. So I know a lot about these things, but I wasn't a lawyer when I started. Um, but I got the knowledge that I needed as I went. And I said, look, I can't give you legal advice, but I can tell you how to put that together into a sentence so somebody understands what it means. Right. And the more that you work with it, the more experience you get as a business English teacher. Surprisingly, I do know a lot about oil and gas law now for Brazil. And I've caught some mistakes from lawyers only because of experience and from being there. But, you know, it's the best thing you can do is take some courses, learn a little bit, understand where the business person is coming from, at least. Um, I have a lot of advantages. It, yeah, well, I was just, sorry to interrupt, but it kind of helps yeah. with the needs analysis process, too, right? Because if somebody comes to you and says... Right. And you have no idea about how businesses are run or yep. what happens day to day. And they say, well, I need to do this. You're going to get that yep. generic me <laughs> how to do yes. speak English Why in meetings course. English? Yeah. Yes. Why do you do you make a presentation? Yes. No. <laughs> okay. There's your needs analysis. There's much more to a good needs analysis. Right. And you're exactly right. The more you understand business, the better a needs analysis you will do and the better you can help your student with it. Exactly. But, you know, just ticking a, ticking a couple of basic boxes and saying, oh, I do a needs analysis. That's not enough. You got to delve much deeper. We got way okay. off topic. I, I know. I, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we got way off topic. So, all right. Yep. So, yes, I agree with those points but you still haven't convinced me on <laughs> again devil's advocate you haven't convinced me completely on not being able to teach it to lower levels because in the mm -hmm. and, and i know that we've been talking about course books we'll kind of circle or this question is circling back a little bit but if mm -hmm. we if we're teaching someone that's at a lower level right do you see that textbooks or even materials that we make and if it's a really experienced teacher that's done a really good needs analysis something along those lines and they're 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 teaching something is it is it only contextualized language or is it wouldn't that be considered business english it's context it's contextualized language from the teacher it's not contextualized language student <laughs> 
I'm so glad I asked that question. Expand, please. <laughs> Who is more important here, the teacher or the student? And this is the problem with course books. Mm. Course books, syllabus, syllabi, most teacher courses and everything else are all teacher centered. None of them center in on the student. And you know what? The most effective business English student needs to be student centered. They need to become autonomous because they're going to use it every day. So everything that we do as a teacher should be student centered and not teacher centered. And this is why it comes into the fact that you, a good business English teacher needs flexibility and adaptability because quite frankly, um, and I, I said this before, the best plan is not to plan. I don't plan classes anymore. I have <laughs> oh my god can of worms hold on <laughs> let me, let me why are you gonna plan a class because what happens with a business english student is you get in and they come in and teacher i have this email i just got from blah 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 can you help me understand there's your class or teacher i have to give a presentation on this there's your class classes happen you don't have to plan classes because I did it for years. I came in, oh, here's a nice handout. We're going to work on this today. And they say, um, teacher, let me ask you a question. And there's your class. Business English happens. Now, I'm not talking with large group classes. You can do some planning there. But even there, business English happens. Something will always come up that needs to be addressed. Okay. So, got it. Remember, I teach mostly, uh, almost. I teach primarily one, one on one to one. So do I. Yeah. So you know, I'm not doing group, and there's a big difference. If you're doing group classes, yes, a lot more planning is involved. But when you're doing one to one, mm -hmm. classes change every day, every single day. I I gave homework to a student of mine the other day, um, and said, okay. He was going to Miami to present something to uh, very important people. And um, we were working on that and working on his opening and everything. Mm -hmm. And when he came to the next class, when he was supposed to have that prepared, uh, something else happened. Okay. And we had to deal with that. This is the normal day of a business English teacher. So why plan? Why? <laughs> Oh, right. you just, you like to just drop the bombs and then walk away. <laughs> of course I do. That's okay. my job. <laughs> so then, okay. So then how would you say, because I, I tend to agree with you based on how I teach as well, because I deal mostly, I have very few, if I have a group, it's two to three people. Cause I don't like to have the large, it's a personal choice. I don't like to have the large groups and my day is similar to yours. I do plan or have an idea where I want to go, but there are these, emergent yeah. emergencies <laughs> that just pop up and then I have to deal sure. with them. So then how can a, a, either a novice teacher or a mm -hmm. novice business teacher mm -hmm. or business English teacher, how can they handle that type of scenario? Because mm -hmm. it's not like it, that's not an easy thing to do. You have to be very no, quick on your feet. Yes. Yes. You got to be smart. You got to be quick on your feet. You got to be resilient. And, you know, you have to be full of, you know what, sometimes because you need to be able to stall. And this is a skill that you actually have to teach your students to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's being able to immediately switch gears. And that scares most normal teachers. Remember, yes. most normal teachers walk into a classroom, there's their set syllabus, follow this, there's the lesson plan, you got to do this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. And I find the people that have the hardest time, university teachers, because they're so set to what they're supposed to do, that they cannot be adaptable. Well, and university teachers are usually is on the podium and lecturing, which is not how business English right. goes at all. 
Oh, but don't tell them that because they say they're business English teachers. Every mm -hmm. single <laughs> Every <laughs> Yeah, no comment from both of us. We agree. <laughs> uh, well, but this is the thing. It's, um, you know, in teaching a group class, for instance, I do this too. I do training classes for a company in Qatar and um, where I have, you know, people from all different departments coming in and we have a topic and it's two days of 10 hours covering that topic. So yeah, we have to cover topics sometimes. So yes, you need a plan. And one of the talks that I have coming up when we're talking about, you know, working with new action oriented procedures, you know, you need to come up with some work with some tasks for them to do. So yes, there is planning involved, mostly for group classes. Um, but again, my reality is one-to-one -one, and the one-to-one -one, um, is really growing with coaching and everything else and everyone going freelance. Um, it, it's a great way to go. And, you know, that requires some totally different skills, you know? Yep. Yeah, because when I when I st well, when I was working at an institute and I was working with business, Inc., like, you know, the market, lead, I'm not trying to say that, yeah. bad, but working with market leader and business result and all of the because the institution dictated this is the business English course that we're, course that we're going to give. But what I ran into was I had um, judges. I had accountants, I had people who worked in the automotive industry, people who were, you know, engineers and stuff. And, and you're working on a case study on women's makeup. Again, it had nothing to do with nothing, you know, it was, it was exactly. just frustrating for me. But, but then when I was able to kind of go out, it's not that I don't reference materials or that I don't plan, like you said, you know, I understand what you meant by it, but oh, no plan whatsoever. And you just walk into class and, and miraculously you have a topic. No, sometimes they're like, okay, yeah, no, everything's good today. So what are mm -hmm. we doing? So then you have to have something ready and kind of on deck, but you sure, use but the materials. Your experience, like, it's there. <laughs> True. Like you, you can just kind of go right into it, but I use those materials sometimes as a jumping off point. Like here, here's a scenario. It's completely unrelated to your work let's relate it. Mm -hmm. What, what's, what's similar, what's different, but that, I mean, that took years of me trying to figure out, oh, okay, how can I use these? Like, so re repeat that again, please. It took that me years. <laughs> okay. So experience. Thank you. Yeah. There's another check mark. Okay. Yeah. We got that one. You're losing Kelly. I know. I know. No, I know. I'm kidding. And, and don't get me wrong about the course books. I think course books are, are fine they're a tool, but they're just one tool that um, you can use. And, you know, they're, if you can find a good case study or you can adapt that case study to make it relevant to those people, like let's say um, the, uh, there's one on women feminine hygiene products and I've got a classroom of males filled with males. You know, I need to be able to adapt that material quickly to their needs because they're just not going to be engaged. <laughs> and quite frankly, uh, trying to explain eyeshadow in Portuguese, I don't know how to say it. Um, you know, the stuff you put on your eye and they go, what? <laughs> okay. Uh, my Portuguese isn't that good. But yeah, it, it's just they are tools there there's material that's good there if you use market leader to learn what a case study is and how to use a case study great but then start making your own and what i do is i make case studies with my students mm -hmm. like they have, it's their actual reality yeah exactly because you know the good thing is the next student I get in that company or in a relative company, mm -hmm. I've already got a case study already developed for that. All right, but let me take it back. So mm -hmm. you've got case studies, but then 
when do you actually work on language and improving proficiency? Every single moment that I'm in class with them. <laughs> okay, because sometimes what I've seen is that uh, at least like with mentoring and teacher training and things like that, they say, oh, this is a case study. So we're just going to be speaking on class and they get excited when people say things like observing lessons. They're just constantly recognizing and acknowledging that people are talking. And then at the end, it's, wow, they were really engaged with that. Yes, but you didn't work on language at all. Did they communicate? Mm, yes, but did, did you? Us. Yes, but then they collaborate. <laughs> yeah, yes. They're interrupting you like I am. <laughs> Were they? Here's the thing: Did they get the task that you set to them accomplished in English? Yes, that's a class. Great. Now, agreed. Remember, we we don't have to fix every single mistake. Agreed. We fix the big ones. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to take care of those fossilized problems of, you know, what every almost every Brazilian does is mixes up he and she or his or her. I yeah. don't know why, but you know, you hear that all the time. They have a C one level, but they mix up his and her. Mm. Um, you know, why is that fossilized? I don't know. But, you know, we need to fix those because those are a big thing. It's easy to just teach them they now. So they and them. Thank God for new pronouns. But um, <laughs> the, the thing is, yes, we are fixing their language. We are improving on their language. What we're doing is we're helping them communicate. We're building their confidence. And hopefully they're finding it much easier to communicate things that they couldn't say before than they did when they came into class. So yeah, we're doing our job because I don't call myself a business English teacher. What do you call yourself? I'm a facilitator of advanced communication skills. Hmm. Do you know what the difference is? No, please expand. It's about a hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> so. You know, then, <laughs> sorry. Um, I like it. I like it. I think I might, I might steal, steal your job title. <laughs> a lot of people are. Um, but no, seriously, what I'm trying to help them with is, no, I don't want to make them either 100% fluent or 100% accurate. I want to find the balance that they need within their job. and. I'm not going to make them perfect. I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. I make mistakes all the time in English. Um, you know, everybody does. But at least if you know how to communicate, get out of your mistakes, work your way around, that's what communication is. And that's what happens in business. Same thing happens with two American businessmen talking to each other. Miscommunication. As long as we can work and try and stop the miscommunication and teach them the skills they need so they can get everything right, that's important. So there's the B2 level. But doesn't your class follow a normal framework? What about my grammar classes? Grammar classes? <laughs> I don't no, because this is one thing. So if, because I'm, I'm actually, see, I was on the, the other side, but now I'm kind of supporting you. <laughs> so, because if we're having lower level learners and they're not able to even function, like structure things or pr produce anything, then we have to have more structured frameworks and like classes that are more developed because they, I, I mean, this is, I'm helping your argument, but <laughs> Because we have to give them the foundation to be able to then be able to focus on communication, right? It, or no. Here's, but here's the thing. Mm. I don't care about those students. I'm teaching C1, C2 executives that are up here. Because you know what? In Let's use Brazil. I did live there 16 years. People think that, you know, I don't know Brazil. I think I know it pretty well. <laughs> uh, 16 years of working there. There's a million other teachers with a B1, B2 level that can teach them basic grammar and teach them basic English. If they're still working on the basics of grammar, 
then they need an English teacher. Ah, I could, okay. So I think we're starting to differentiate these two things. What's a yeah. business English teacher and what's a, yeah, a general English teacher and what's the difference? Yeah. Okay. Working with grammar, for me, when you're still working with grammar, vocabulary, and things like that, you know, I'm taking out Sally shopping on Sunday to the mall, you know, I'm, and I'm talking B1 below, definitely, maybe even two and below. That's an English teacher. Okay. Great. And there's a need for that. Okay. You know, I was one too. I, and it you know, can be I, contextualized, right? So it's not saying that that's not, we, we can put it in the context of business, but that's not business English necessarily. That's where you draw exactly, the line. Exactly. Okay. Because, you know, if you, let me say you just, and I know it's not you, but, um, you know, you worked at McDonald's when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. So you understand the basic words for service. Mm -hmm. So now you have the right context that they need so you're a great asset to their classes mm -hmm. because you know how to serve and to work with that okay which is why i say when you start getting into business and you start getting into economic financial uh terminology if you don't know what they're talking about how are you going to help them mm -hmm. How are you going to help them if you don't even understand the question that they are asking you? So this is why I say keep general English here and keep doing what you're doing. Now, if you want to contextualize a little bit, great. When I first started teaching English, I was in Puerto de Galinas. Mm -hmm. And people came up to me and said, oh, you speak English. Oh, you know, I wasn't a teacher yet. And they said, will you teach me English? Mm -hmm. And what's up there? It's all restaurants, hotels, and stores. That's all there are tourism. in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. It's all tourism. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I worked with the context that was important to them. I didn't teach them I take on Sally shopping. I taught them, sir, I don't have a fork. One moment, I will get one. Mm -hmm. And that's what I worked on. I worked on within their context what they needed. Yeah, you could say that was basic business English. But I was dealing with people that work at an A1 level. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, no, they're really not learning how to speak English. They're learning how to mimic. Which, I mean, aren't we all, though, when we're learning language? Oh, exactly. Sure we are. But they are they really learning how to contextualize a new sentence? So if the guy says, oh, I, I have a broken fork, they know the right answer. But then when the guy comes up and says, oh, I have a broken knife, and then if... Hmm? <laughs> Because they don't understand. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being no, I, I, yeah, I, to exemplify it, I understand. So then, yeah. And remember some of the courses in Rio, which you repeat after me, repeat, 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 repeat. I don't know if you're, I won't mention names. Um, good because it got them talking, but what it didn't do is teach them how to form their own sentences, it just taught them mimicking. Right. So it's a little bit of both is needed sometimes. Yeah. But this is general English, not business English. Because the, because the delineation that you're kind of making is they're not able to use their uh, what they know as a specialist in their field. They're not able to explain Correct. themselves. They're not able to to kind of get into the the nitty gritty, I guess we can say. Correct. Okay of being able to do it so that's where you start making the difference between it's not that it's not business english it's related it's contextualized it might be something that they use in the future but it's still um maybe i just don't like saying it's general english maybe it's like a foundation building or life skills like you said before or it's something else it's it's giving them the tools to be able to actually do business because doing business is much different sure. than learning and building proficiency and learning about business right it's you know this is the thing if you go through 
this is what I was doing all morning. We, I was telling you about, I was going through the CEFR um, companion guide and you go through all these charts and everything and you see B1, they're not proficient at anything. They have an ability to do simple things. That's not a business professional. Go to any executive who owns any business and say, oh, will you hire me? I'm able to do simple things. Nothing complex, <laughs> nothing technical. I can't deal with the intricacies of having a meeting or negotiating, but I can do simple things and see if you get hired. That's a B1 level. Okay. Well, all right. Now I'm going to push back a little bit. I'm going to take my Kelly hat off. Do okay. you think though, because you have, you have 16 years in Brazil, I've been here for 12, oh God, like 12 now. So, okay. When, when business, I'm going to word this as, as carefully as I can. When business is put on the job uh, under like the requirements, right? On the job opening, they say advanced level English. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. First of all, uh, for those of you who are outside of Brazil, realize that 95% of Brazilians say they speak advanced English, yet only 5% actually do. Yeah, the, so, the, the statistics are, are quite dreadful here. Yeah. But, but I think that I, I can't blame the Brazilian population. I think that there's been a lot of a kind of manipulation almost because here's what happens. Schools create their own level system. They don't go by the CEFR. So they say, oh, well, you did, you completed level five. Well, what does level five mean? Well, level five is the maximum capacity that our teachers are able to teach you. Yeah. Which, which is, is that probably it? B1. B2, I would say like B2. So, I mean, it's getting better, maybe a C1, but that's the maximum that our teachers are capable of teaching you. But you can't label that as advanced. So I think uh, there's been a lot of, I, I really do feel bad sometimes for the Brazilian yeah. people because they've been okay. almost taken advantage of in, in terms of they think mm -hmm. that this is advanced level, but it's not. And then the, the companies are actually making it even worse because they'll say advanced level English. And then when you go to take the test, they give you a general English test. Give it usually given by a human resources person or a manager who has no idea of analysis evaluation and their level of English is not good. They right. say, oh, this person has an accent, so they don't know how to speak English. Yep. And so it, it's just perpetuating this problem sure. of, of at what, what is advanced level English because. But here, here also remember if, as long as you're saying the bad things about Brazil, um, I would remember say because that, I've been working here, then not, I mean, yeah. this could be happening around the world too. I have no oh, idea. No, and I agree with you, and I'm sure it is happening around the world. Um, I hear of other stories of this, uh, uh, but we're only picking on Brazil because we both know the market well. Right. Um, and by no means is it just Brazil. But you, you can go through and get your degree as an English teacher in a university in Brazil without ever speaking English. And you're a qualified English teacher with a degree. Um, there's one of the problems. Number two, do you remember, I remember, I was still teaching Just there. Just to when stop you Roma, there, because that might be yeah. changing. They are, they do have a lot that they're gonna try and get a, the all, if you're considered a bilingual school, your uh -huh. English teachers have to have a, a minimum of a B2 certificate. <laughs> Try C1, C2, though. But there, I mean, this and is going to public tried. schools yes, and I stuff know. like that. So it's like, they're this tried. is the first level. the And that's the minimum requirement, so. I know, I know. that's good. But <laughs> They are trying when, to change this. <laughs> good. Remember when Dilma was president? Mm. Dilma made a law that allowed um, companies, Brazilian companies, to hire foreigners for the jobs that they needed if they could not find a qualified Brazilian to do it. Mm -hmm. And I had a student in one of my classes um, who had been studying English for about 15 years, mm -hmm. who one day complained in horrible English, by the way, um, that 
she's training a British woman to do her job. She goes, she knows nothing about computer programming, yet I'm teaching her and she's getting three times as much money as I am. I think that's wrong. And I said, well, quite frankly, what's the requirement of the job? And they said, fluency in English, being able to program. And said, obviously, they found out that it was easier to teach her programming than it was to teach you how to speak English. You know, this is the problem that they have. And it became such a big problem that the president had to change the law. Yeah. Because they just don't teach to the level of English that's needed. And they've allowed everybody to write advanced English on their CVs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you say, they don't do proper testing. Um, go back to something we talked about. Remember the, um, the was it Students Without Borders mm. a few years back? Okay. Well, Students Without Borders, you know, they all passed the, quote, test to be able to go overseas. Almost every single one of them was shipped back because their level of English was not good enough overseas. And it's just setting people up. Up. it's setting people up for failure. Failure. Yes, and, that, I, and I think that's in the, and that's why I have compassion and empathy for the Brazilian people that are trying to learn and actually genuinely trying to learn is because they're they've sure. been set up for failure. And, right. and what they need is somebody that's not saying they're teaching them business English when they don't have any idea what business English is. Okay. So what they need is for the teachers out there to honestly teach what they're capable of teaching mm -hmm. and honestly advertise what they're capable of teaching. And that means getting some qualification in teaching business English. You know, get out there, network with other people that are doing business English, yeah. join the BSIG, you know, how many people are joined in the BSIG around the world? Do you, you know? Oh, well, oh, well, in Brazil, I think it's around 140 at this point. Great. Thankfully, it finally got going. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's why I started it years ago, because there was a need. And, you know, one of the problems was, is that there was no joining. Mm -hmm. Now there is. This is what you need to network with other like professionals and to learn best practices of business English teaching. Um, you know, get certifications in business English. Get some business background behind you. Do whatever. I, I was lucky. I was in business in the States. Mm -hmm. I have experience. And it's funny how every single one of the authors, almost everyone that I know of the authors of business English books and the people who are big names in business English, mm -hmm. All that's some business background. Yeah. Incidents? No. 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 Because we come from it from a different perspective, too. That's that's usually what happens is that if you have a little bit, or even if you take, like you said, the Coursera edX, you, you see things from a different perspective. You see it right. more more functionally as opposed to um, a, a, just a pure teaching background. So yeah. I do you think that we've answered the question? I don't think we've answered anything. Hopefully everybody's more confused and will stay tuned, buy all my books and go to my talks and listen to all your podcasts. Right. Oh, no, but you know. I think we've hashed out some things. Like there there has to be a delineation between or a line drawn between what is oh God, I, we would have to find like a really good terminology to define that period of starting. And getting mm -hmm. to the point of proficiency where now, now you can start building mm -hmm. on things and really using the language to your advantage and, and doing business. But that period, I mean, it's, it's hard to, I, I don't think, because I don't think, I think it, I don't think it should be classified as general English because it, it can be different, but the, like the skill training skill, life skills, it's huh? It's English. It's, it's just English. English. It's just just English. Yeah, and I just use general English. Just you know, it, it 
just because it's general. We'll just call it English. Okay. So um, you have to have that base. And then once you have that base, then you can, one, if you find a qualified teacher that kind of knows what they're doing and can do a no, proper that detail, knows just... what they're doing, not kind of knows, <laughs> that knows what they're doing and can contextualize English in the business environment mm -hmm. to help you, then you're okay. That's okay. when you become a business English teacher. When you can work with anybody's context and actually help them with communication within their own context. Because remember, I'm not teaching them how to negotiate, which a lot of, quote, in business English teachers out there mm. try to teach them negotiation skills. They wouldn't have the job if they couldn't negotiate. Right. But they need your help to negotiate in English, in English. Yeah. what they can already do in their own language. Mm -hmm. And this is the distinction. There's there's a lot of courses out there that are teaching all these other skills that that's not our job. We're English teachers. Yeah, and, we're language teachers. We don't need we don't need to teach. I mean, uh, you know, English. Oh, or, uh, or, uh, be careful. What? I, I had to stop myself. Don't. Well, we don't need to teach some of this other stuff that everybody no, else. Oh, why not? Why can't I? Say, I'm going to say it. It's my podcast. You don't need to teach that type of stuff because typically those people already know what you can do is raise awareness to skills and strategies that they already have. Yes. And say, hey, okay, so you know how to do this, right? Because most of my students are very well informed and they know they, they take continuous professional development courses. They're constantly learning things. And, mm -hmm. and all you have to say is, great, you learned this. How can you then apply it? But like, let's do it in English. Well, how, how can we, how can we? So That's I don't have job. to teach them anything. Professionals, if they're good professionals, they know how to develop themselves on their own. Sure. Exactly. So we're not doing that. We're teaching them English within the business context that they already know. Mm. So we're facilitators of advanced communication skills. Hundred dollars more. <laughs> okay, then. Okay, let's. Well, I mean, we can be very honest. And and what would oh, you say? Oh, we have to start. Oh yeah. So, do, oh. what would you say to a person? Because I have my own. But what would you say to a person that comes to you and says, "Well, Rob, I have this student. Da, 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 it's a different area. They're going into. I don't know. Whatever. It, it, it's a different." Uh, business than, or industry than you've worked with before. Where do I start? What do I do? What would you tell that person? Honestly. I, yeah, no, I would say go for it. Just let the person know I know nothing about that industry. Mm. Where to learn it together. Teach me. This is what I do and how I learned everything that I've learned about the industry. Here's a great example. Hmm. Here's the class. Kelly, you're a front end programmer, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I have no idea what that means. Um, you know, can you explain your job to me? Can you tell me how this works? What's the front end? What's everything? I have them teaching me. Now, number one, they're communicating and I'm fixing their English as they go along because they'll make slips and mistakes in grammar, mm -hmm. but they know the terminology. Mm -hmm. And while they're teaching me, I'm learning their job to an extent, but I'm learning what they need to communicate within their job. And I can help them with the structures. So when they do have to sit down and talk about it, mm -hmm. they've already done it. This is a great way of doing it. So if, um, you know, if you're going into a whole new market and I have no idea what the market is, say, just be honest with your student and say, well, I don't know anything. Let's learn together or you teach me what you know. And I'll help you with the English. And can then, I add a ca caveat to that? Just a little asterisk there. Yeah. If you don't have the time to invest in looking into that industry, don't take that client on. No, then you shouldn't be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs>
You know, if you can't make the time to do what's best for your student, you shouldn't be teaching. You should be doing Well, maybe some... just not teaching them is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, if, you know, and if, if somebody came to me and came with something that I have absolutely no interest in, mm. and really I don't see any advantage of it for me, right. I'm going to hand it off to another teacher. Like, let's say, well, I do like to cook, but let's say um, a baker. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not really into baking that much. So if if I had to go and learn all new things to help them, no, I have a friend in New Zealand who's a baker, and I'll send the student to him. Okay. And say, here, here's the best person to help you with this. They already know what you're doing. I don't have time to learn. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, be honest, there's enough students out there, you know. Yeah, you don't have to take everybody on, because that's the other thing. If you start taking everybody on in all the industries, you're going to be overwhelmed, and you might not have time to really actually help your students. They're just going to leave frustrated and dissatisfied. Yeah. And this is the other thing. If you do a good job with the students you have, you'll always have more students. Mm -hmm. You'll always have more students. So become a better teacher. Don't become better at social media and dancing on TikTok. You know, I know it works for some people, but, um, you know, I've never advertised my business in over 20 years. Never made a single ad. And I'm constantly full. In fact, you want to take a couple of students of mine, Kelly? <laughs> I'll take them. <laughs> okay. We'll talk later. No, Not the ones okay. that I'm facilitating, though. The ones that I'm an English teacher, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> fair. Fair enough. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time because we've been chatting for quite a bit. But um, I don't, And I actually don't think we answered any of the questions that we had proposed. <laughs> Perfect. We're just like politicians. So um, <laughs> talked for hours and said absolutely nothing. No, I think no. That, that was very informative but it's just too hard to make distinctions nowadays it's 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 a little more complex than we it's an argument that'll never be resolved i mean you know i've been with bsig for eight years now with iatefo bsig and um, you know been on the committee and i know some of the biggest names in business english and eh, we argue about this stuff all the time and <laughs> Everybody has a different outlook. Everybody has a different perspective. And it, it's just, just like every business English student has different needs, every business English professional has different abilities, different opinions, and that's what makes the world great. If we do a good job, we match the right student with the right professional. Right. Um, but I said professional. So that means know what you're doing and do it right. Don't just say, I can do it because you can. So um, I will teach you how to fly a plane later on, even <laughs> though I've never done one, okay? Fair. Fair enough. Well, Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank you, and you're welcome back anytime for your controversial looks on anything. <laughs> we should talk about I actually do want you to come back and talk about all of the – the the one that you the talk that you did with edgyfest about um the info gurus of the world <laughs> yes oh yes. because i think that would be just very beneficial because now we have teacherpreneurship all over oh yeah. yeah everybody's a teacher uh, first you know first everybody was a teacher now everybody is a teacher trainer now everybody is an info guru and you know what there's been so many people i i watched this in brazil and i still laugh at it um that you know people oh i've been doing this for two whole weeks and now i'm an expert you know <laughs> let me show you how to build your business at ten thousand a week yeah it's it's yes it's awesome. I, i'm gonna i'm gonna get you ten thousand students every week um how many students can you teach at a time <laughs> How many um, students can you teach? Let's add, how many students can you teach well? Because if you don't teach them well, they're not coming back. Yes. And and that's the whole thing. If you do, like I said, if you do your job right, you will always get students without social media. Mm -hmm. 
and social you know, media can help, but it's not necessary. It's not necessary. And remember, with social media, now you're advertising to the world. Do I really want to be advertising to the world, to the guy who calls me up and says, yes, well, I live in a very poor country. I make $1 a month. Will you teach me for free? I'm sorry. I don't have the time for that. Although I do teach a few students for free in Brazil every year. That's what I do personally. But, um, you know, I, I seriously... One of the things, I'll give you a hint about the talk. Take a piece of paper, put your phone number, a little, cut the little slips, and put it up on the side of the wall in your neighborhood. That's the how you're going to get the best qualified leads for students you've ever had because they know what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be advertising to the world. Trust me. I've seen what happens. <laughs> Okay, so we'll we'll save that for the next episode because I want to go down that rabbit hole with you. <laughs> Good. All right, so well, thank you very much, uh, and then we'll we'll put all your contact information in the show notes so that everybody can get in touch with Great. you and uh, contact you. Not by well, no, you have social media, but mostly it's your yeah. website. Right. Yeah, it's, I have the website. I have social media. Usually, it's just to wish everybody a happy birthday and. <laughs> You know, because we have the BSIG and we advertise there and right. I tell them, you know, I need to monitor this stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I I put delicious food recipes on there, things like that. Um, you know, stupid jokes, you name it, they're there. But I don't advertise the business. Okay. I do advertise EFL Talks when we do talks, yeah. but uh, that's nonprofit. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much, sir. And we'll see everybody soon. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Real Talk and ELT. Want to join the conversation? Head on over to Instagram at Kelly Peddington ELT and send me a message. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube or Spotify channel to stay up to date. And of course, take care of yourself, your health, your vibe, and your tribe. Until next time.